Namaste. Trying a different camera this morning. So this is the conclusion of the discussion on Brihadaranyaka, chapter 4, section 3, verse 7. <laughs> there. <laughs> Boy, we are deep into it, aren't we? Anyway, as you have experienced, if you've been following this series, there is a lot of nectar buried in the deep strata of Shankaracharya's commentary on Brihadaranyaka. So we have been going through with a fine tooth comb, but here I want to skip the rest of the discussion on this verse. And the reason why is that it is about Buddhism, Buddhism, single quotes, <laughs> lowercase, as you notice in the title. <laughs> Why? Well, it has to do with my opinion of Buddhism <laughs> today. Uh, the first thing is that the arguments taken up by Shankara are from schools of Buddhism that in many cases died out centuries ago. And practically nobody except maybe a few scholars in Tibet really, you know, keep up with it or continue to write about it. or You know, it's just not taught widely at all. And the second reason is that today's Buddhism, lowercase, has very little to do with Buddha's actual teaching. There, I said it. <laughs> you know, um, it's like dogs got to bark, fish got to swim, and scholars have to argue. So they use the authority of someone like the Buddha to base a whole school of philosophical interpretation on. And in the process, the original is lost or covered up. And this is exactly what has happened in modern Buddhism. Uh, uh, I'm not even going to take up Mahayana Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, because it's obvious to anyone that their sutras are completely exaggerated. You know, they talk about Buddha being there sitting somewhere in a, in a town or something in India, and thousands and millions and billions of these celestial beings of various types are assembled in the heavens listening to his every word. Oh, come on, people. This sounds like a Cecil B. DeMille production, you know, cast of millions. Um, come on, you know, let's bring it back down to earth here. Buddha was a human being, an ordinary human being. Nothing special about him, except he took the trouble to look into consciousness very deeply. And basically, everything he taught in his original suttas, the Theravada suttas, as far as I can tell, are the closest to the originals. And everything he taught is absolutely consistent with our understanding of Sushupti consciousness and Raja Yoga from the Vedas. Absolutely fits that category to a T. So, you know, we have no quarrel with the Buddha at all. Um, I'm going to read you some excerpts in a minute that will show how we don't. And, uh, well, I mean, we've discussed it numerous times how the highest state of jhana or meditation, according to the Buddha, is neither perception nor non-perception. And he doesn't then go on to say, and then you're going to realize Brahman. 
<laughs> he doesn't need to. The Buddha's teaching is apophatic, not ex explicit, okay? He says, look, you do this practice, you have this experience, you set your mind up this way, you do like that, and he knows that if you actually put yourself in that state, you will get it. You will see. <laughs> so he doesn't need to tell you about it. You need to do the practices and see it for yourself. Duh. You know, that's why at so many places in the suttas, I mean, hundreds of places in the suttas, when a student comes to the point where they understand the teaching well enough to practice it on their own without further guidance, you know, and, and just time and effort is the only thing separating them from realization. Buddha would tell them, go alone, not in a ret meditation retreat, not in a monastery, not in a group class or you know, whatever, with others, go alone to the roots of a tree, to the bank of a river, to an abandoned building, to a forest, even a field where nobody's going to disturb you and do what has to be done. And by that time, the student should understand what that means well enough that he doesn't need to say anything more. That guy is out of there the next morning. So let me read you some excerpts from my Buddhist mentor's book, Jnanananda, Bhikkhu Jnanananda, Katakurunde Jnanananda, not the other Jnanananda that's building temples everywhere. Um, Katakurunde, he said this to me in so many words in person, but he writes, very often the commentaries are unable to say something conclusive regarding the meaning of deep suttas. So they simply give some possible interpretations and the reader finds himself at a loss to choose the correct one. Sometimes the commentaries go at a tangent and miss the correct interpretation. And why the commentaries are silent on some deep suttas is also a problem to modern-day scholars. There are some historical reasons leading to this state of affairs in the commentaries. In the Ani Sutta of the Nidana Vagga in the Sangyutta Nikaya, we find the Buddha making certain prophetic utterances regarding the dangers that will befall the sasana in the future. So at this point, I'm just going to go and read that directly from the sutta itself. It's called the Sadhama Sutta, the counterfeit of the true Dhamma. Thus I have heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anathapindaka's Park. Then the Venerable Mahakasyapa approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down on one side, and said to him, Venerable Sir, what is the reason, what is the cause, why formerly there were fewer training rules, but more bhikkhus were established in final knowledge, while now there are more training rules, but fewer bhikkhus are established in final knowledge? Buddha replied, That's the way it is, Kashyapa. When beings are deteriorating and the true Dhamma is disappearing, there are more training rules, but fewer bhikkhus are established in final knowledge. Kashyapa, the true Dhamma does not disappear so long as a counterfeit of the true Dhamma has not arisen in the world. But when a counterfeit of the true Dhamma arises in the world, then the true Dhamma disappears. So this is all you need to know about Buddhism. One single quotes. <laughs>
Double quotes mean this is what a certain person said. Like when we put the Buddha's suttas up on the screen, his speech is enclosed in double quotes because we know that individual spoke those words. But when a quote or citation is general, you know, like people say, or everyone says, or it is commonly known or commonly said that Buddhism, <laughs> in single quotes, that means Buddhism in general, or the way people understand Buddhism, Buddha's teaching, or the way that people practice Buddhism. Buddhism, single quotes, has deviated from the original teaching. And in the sutta I just read, the Buddha predicts that it will be so. And how is it so? Well, there's another sutta <laughs> called the drum peg that illustrates the reason why. At Savati, once upon a time, mendicants, the Dasaharas, had a clay drum called the commander. Each time the commander split, they repaired it by inserting another peg. But there came a time when the clay drum commander's original wooden rim disappeared and only a mass of pegs remained. In the same way, in a future time, there will be mendicants who won't want to listen when the discourse is spoken by the realized one, deep, profound, transcendent, dealing with emptiness, are being recited. They won't actively listen or try to understand, nor will they think those teachings are worth learning and memorizing. So here Buddha foretells the current situation. See, all the trouble began at the time of Buddha Ghosh. Buddha Ghosh literally burned all the original commentaries on the Buddha suttas and wrote all new commentaries along with his disciples and also wrote some, some really deviant works such as the so-called Abhidhamma, which begins with a made-up story about how the Buddha uh, went to heaven and gave a lecture to the, to the gods and how he told his philosophy all different from the way it was taught down here because the gods are more intelligent and blah, blah, blah. This is nonsense. It is simply a redefinition of the core terms of the Buddha's teaching. And what is the Buddha's actual teaching? The middle way, Paticca Samuppada. And we've done a lot of presentations on that. Paticca Samuppada begins from the fact of ignorance. Ignorance is the same as maya, that which is not. The false knowledge, the illusion, okay? So from this illusion, which consists of lust, aversion, and delusion, the delusion that one can exist as an individual, then arise fabrications. See, and these fabrications lead to states of consciousness. And consciousness leads to name and form. And name and form leads to the sense organs and so on. And this is exactly how we create the body that we live in now. It begins with a fabrication, sankhara. So that means that if you're discussing, as, as the Buddhists <laughs> quoted, in the last part of this commentary on uh, 437. If, like them, you're spinning and weaving and fabricating various theories about consciousness, speculating, basically, about consciousness, you're not talking about consciousness really at all. You're only talking about your ideas about it, about words about it. And of course, they were trying to distance themselves from the Vedic teachings and all of this. But all they wound up doing is confusing everyone, including themselves. So basically, if you're talking about 
a theory of consciousness, you are fabricating something about a fabrication. Huh? It's like a, a, a reality show on television. I mean, television right away is an illusion, a fabrication, a nothing, a nonsense, a maya, right? And then inside of that, they're making another unreality and then presenting that as reality, <laughs> a reality show. <laughs> Maybe it should be in single quotes, huh? <laughs> so, all right. The Buddhists are spinning tales about nothing, basically. A fabrication. Consciousness itself is a fabrication. And the Buddha explains in his Paticca Samuppada exactly how it comes about. So then they're fabricating something based on the fabrication. It's like pouring the empty into the void. I mean, literally. Literally, because Buddha... Basically, you can interchange the words emptiness, shunyata, and maya. They both mean the same thing. They both refer to the same thing, which is the extensive illusion that manifests as the creation and so on. So what is the use of this? You know? So that means, okay, if you followed along so far, Sorry for this long-winded explanation, but believe me, it's worth it. Because, okay, if some Buddhist tries to tell you that, you know, whatever one of their theories they bring up, it doesn't matter which one. Their arguments as a whole don't matter at all, because all you have to do is, is bring up the sutta about the peg in the drum, and how, you know, after all this time from the Buddha speaking his original teaching until now, all the original pegs, all the original words of the Buddha have been replaced. And nothing of the original is left in people's understanding. Only the various patches that the succeeding teachers in the Buddha's line have made so that their lame philosophy will go unnoticed. Really, that's why they do that. You know, that's why these guys make this stuff up. It's only to cover up their own lapses. They didn't get what the Buddha was teaching. They don't even study the original teachings now, only the commentaries. Somehow, Jnanananda goes on to write in his book, somehow the idea got established in the Buddha Sasana, the community, that the original suttas aren't really very advanced. They're in simple language for simple-minded people, but we are so much more intelligent that our commentaries now explain everything, you know, especially the Abhidhamma and all this. You know, I mean, come on, people. So the one argument that nullifies anything a so-called Buddhist can come up with is just that. Whatever you're saying is not present in the original teaching of the Buddha. And so it's not based on anything substantial. So it's not even worth listening to. You know, don't bother trying to convince me. We're go you're going nowhere. Huh? This is the only argument you need to defeat any so-called Buddhist. <laughs> because that is the sad state of the Buddha's teaching today. Now in the next episode, we'll proceed to the next verses. <laughs> 4, 3, 8, and 9. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.